Good morning and welcome to the Disaster Scenarios webinar series. My name is Erica Podest and I will be your instructor for today's webinar. We will also have a guest instructor, Dr. Eric Fielding, who will be talking about interferometric synthetic aperture radar. The material for this series has been assembled with the help of Elizabeth Hook, Sean McCartney, and Amita Mehta. This is the third and last of a three-part disaster scenarios webinar series. Today's webinar is focused on landslides and earthquakes. As part of today's webinar, I will show you different data sets available to monitor landslides and earthquakes to support decision-making activities. All of the different data products that will be discussed in this webinar are freely available. The learning objectives of this webinar are to identify data relevant to landslides and earthquakes and their impacts, learn about the characteristics of the data, and learn how to interpret the data. So today I'll address the following issues related to earthquakes and landslides, such as what areas have been affected by an earthquake, what areas have been damaged by an earthquake, and the areas affected might not have been damaged, so therefore this is an important distinction. What areas are at risk for landslides and what is the landslide impact, as well as other potential applications. First, a little background on the impact of earthquakes. A 2018 report published by the United Nations looked at economic and human losses as a result of disasters from 1998 through 2017. And they reported that even though earthquakes are the third most common disaster, they are responsible for 56% of deaths from all disasters listed here, which amounts to 747,234 deaths from, uh, 19, from the period of 1998 through 2017. There are other RSET trainings that you would or might find of interest and that support disasters related to earthquakes. There have been two synthetic aperture radar or SAR trainings. One was an introduction to SAR and the other one was an advanced SAR training. Both webinars discussed the use of radar interferometry to look at earthquake deformation. Also, both trainings are freely available online through the link above. So each of these SAR trainings was a four-part webinar series, and the specific training that discusses earthquakes was uh, number four, was the fourth webinar in each of these series. Now let's discuss products that allow us to identify areas affected by an earthquake. The Advanced Rapid Imaging and Analysis for Natural Hazards platform, also known as ARIA, is a NASA JPL project that uses radar images, different global positioning systems, and other data sets to generate products related to different disasters. The analysis is done on a disaster-by-disaster -disaster basis, including earthquakes and landslides. So ARIA generates science products and urgent urgent response products for the science and disasters community. Analysis of these data sets are typically handcrafted following each event and are not generated rapidly and reliably enough for response to natural disasters. However, ARIA is developing the infrastructure to generate imaging products in near real time that can improve situational awareness for disaster response. You can access the ARIA portal through the link provided here. And if you go to the event response link, you can see products generated for different disasters that have occurred in the last three to four years. And you can download these products um, for free. So let's go directly to the ARIA webpage right here. And if you click on event response, 
you'll be guided to another web, uh, another page that has a list of all of the disaster related products that ARIA has responded to and has, has generated products for. Okay. And you can download these products. So if you go to event response data, data sharing, you can uh, click on any of these disasters and download the products. So here's a, an example of a deformation map generated by ARIA. And this is for an area in southern Mexico called Chiapas that was inflicted by a magnitude 8.1 earthquake on September 7th, 2017. Uh, it occurred near midnight local time, early morning on September 8th, UTC time. So this was the strongest earthquake to hit Mexico in more than a century and the largest earthquake worldwide in 2017. And it caused a significant humanitarian crisis with 41,000 homes damaged and at least 98 deaths. This earthquake also triggered landslides throughout the region. So ARIA scientists used synthetic aperture radar images from the European Space Agency's Sentinel-1A and B uh, satellites. They have uh, radar sensors. And they used data before and after the event to generate an interferometric, uh, through interferometric SAR, this map of surface deformation caused by the earthquake. So this is a false color map that shows the amount of permanent surface movement caused almost entirely by the earthquake, as viewed by the satellite. Uh, so it was during a six day interval between radar images acquired by the two Sentinel uh, satellites. One, the before image was acquired on September 7th, before the event, and the after image was acquired on September 13th, uh, 2017. So the colors that you're seeing here represent surface motion. The red tones indicate that the areas along the coast of Chiapas and Oaxaca moved towards the satellite by as much as 22 centimeters, that's around nine, nine inches. Uh, in a combination of up and eastward motion. The blue indicates the areas that moved away from the satellite, mostly downward or westward, by as much as 15 centimeters or about six inches. The gray areas are either open water or heavy vegetation. And heavy vegetation prevents the radar from measuring change between the satellite images. The green star, down here in the ocean shows the location of the earthquake epicenter as estimated by the United States Geological Survey or US, USGS, National Earthquake Information Center. So again, if we go to the website, the portal, uh, you can actually download this um, this surface uh, movement map. So if you go to event response, event response data sharing, and down here you select 2017 Oaxaca, Chiapas, Mexico under interferogram. You can access that product. Through that website, you can also access interferometric maps that show you the deformation, the surface deformation. And Dr. Eric Fielding will be explaining uh, in more detail how to interpret these interferometric products. Dr. Eric Fielding is a geophysicist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Hello, yes, uh, I'm going to tell you a very brief uh, amount of information about interferograms uh, for other uh, more detailed information. You'll have to check out some of the other RSET tutorials. Interferograms are uh, a type of difference between two radar images, and it shows uh, the amount of uh, ground motion that's happened 
uh, during the time interval of the interfer of, uh, the, between the two radar images. Uh, this particular image uh, that's shown on the screen here was uh, processed uh, from the Copernicus Sentinel-1 data that was acquired uh, by the, the Copernicus uh, Se Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-1A uh, and 1B satellites in September of 2017. Uh, the two images are uh, 12 days apart, uh, which gives a, uh, a, a short time interval. And these uh, contour lines of color uh, that are shown on the screen show uh, they're like contour lines on a map. And the, uh, but instead of showing uh, contour, uh, contours of topography, they're showing contours of uh, ground deformation. Uh, the areas where the contour lines are close together means that the uh, ground was mo moved a lot. And the areas where they're farther apart means that the ground moved uh, much less. This particular earthquake, a magnitude 8.1 earthquake, on the uh, in September of 2017, uh, was primarily located offshore in the uh, Gulf of Tehuantepec in southern Mexico, uh, offshore of the uh, provinces of Chiapas and Oaxaca uh, in, in southern Mexico. And the interferogram shows these contour lines that go a long distance along the coast. And that tells us that this earthquake uh, had a very long uh, fault rupture. And the fact that the uh, contour lines uh, are all continuous and don't have any uh, discontinuities in them uh, indicates to us that the uh, fault rupture was all offshore and it did not reach uh, the land part of this area. So this is one of the uh, uh, very a brief example of how uh, we can use uh, radar interferograms, the difference between radar images uh, to measure uh, ground deformation associated with an earthquake. In this case, uh, the earthquake is mostly offshore. So this is showing a series of uh, these uh, colored lines or contours. Uh, each contour in this case is one half of the radar wavelength. This, since this is using data from the uh, Copernicus Sentinel-1 satellite, which has a radar wavelength of about six centimeters, each one of these contour lines is about three centimeters of ground motion. So uh, we can count uh, the number of fringes here, or, or fringes or contour lines. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's about seven uh, contour lines across uh, from the uh, coast of uh, the, the the right side uh, near the coast to to the uh, to the back, and that means that there's um, six uh, fringes is uh, 18 centimeters of uh, ground motion. Uh, six times three, so uh, the that means that the earthquake uh, caused uh, about 18 centimeters of motion on the ground uh, during this 8.2 earthquake. So uh, if we use other satellites, uh, we we'll ha could have different radar wavelengths. So these uh, contour lines are proportional to the, uh, the radar wavelength. You, you have to be careful about uh, uh, the interpretation of the, the, the contour lines. Next, we will discuss products to assess earthquake damage. The area platform provides damage proxy maps and they're available on a disaster by disaster basis. And they identify areas where there has been significant ground surface change. So these products are not yet operational. They are generated as soon as possible after a major disaster, and hence they're not fully validated. Preliminary validation is done, however, by comparing SAR images with optical satellite data. So uh, these products are uh, intended to be used as guidance to identify damaged areas. 
So let's go back to the same example as before, which is the Chiapas, Mexico earthquake that occurred on September 7, 2017. And here we have a damage proxy map from ARIA of that same area. Uh, and this was uh, done or generated using Sentinel-1A and B images from before and after the events. And so these are the same images that um, were used for the ground movement product that I showed you earlier. The before image was acquired on September 7th, before the event, and the after image was acquired on September 13, uh, 2017. The map here depicts areas that were likely damaged by the event. And the, this map covers an area of around 155 by 106 miles, or 250 by 170 kilometers. And each pixel is about 30 meters uh, uh, spatial resolution. The color variation from yellow to red indicates increasingly more significant ground surface change. Preliminary validation um, was done comparing these to Digital Globe, which is an optical um, sensor. And this damage proxy map uh, should be used only as guidance to identify damaged areas. And again, if we go back to the ARIA webpage, you can access these uh, data sets. We go back to that directory. There's a directory called DPM. So that's a damage proxy map. If you click there, uh, you can access that product as a PNG, as a GeoTIFF, or as a KMC file. So let's just click on the PNG, and you've got your product right there. Or uh, you can also download it as a KMZ. So there are other damage assessment products uh, available. And another one is from the International Charter. And this is a worldwide collaboration making satellite data available for disaster management and is composed of global space agencies and space system operators. There are 34 contributing satellites. And the way it works is that whenever a disaster occurs or is about to occur, an authorized charter user submits a request to activate the charter, which mobilizes the space and associated ground resources associated with the charter members in order to obtain data and information on a major disaster. Authorized users are the only bodies authorized to directly request an activation of the charter. They may also request support on behalf of another user uh, uh, with which they uh, cooperate for relief purposes. So the International Charter has a list of all activations and associated products. And let's just go directly to the web page. So this is the International Charter. And if you go to activations and select September 2017 Mexico earthquake, so we'll go up here and select activations. And you have a list of all of the activations. We scroll down to September of 2017. And we select earthquake in Mexico. This was a powerful 7.1 magnitude earthquake that struck central Mexico on September 19th, 2017. The epicenter was approximately 34 miles south-southwest of the city of Puebla and 75 miles from Mexico City. The capital city was particularly affected by the earthquake where almost half of the casualties took place and many people were trapped under collapsed buildings and rescuers had to spend days searching for survivors. So in this page, you will find several derived damage assessment products for different cities affected from this earthquake. Um, and these products are derived using different uh, remote sensing data sets. So if you click down here, you'll see the different products, damage assessment for Coatepec Madero, Coatlitlan, Mexico City, and they were generated, here's the source, um, 
that was used to generate that product. So if we click on this one, uh, this is an example of a damage proxy map for the time, town of Jojutla in the state of Morelos, which is approximately 85 kilometers west of the epicenter. And there are 1,102 uh, 1, potentially damaged structures identified and marked with red dots here in this figure. A Pleiades image was used for post events. That would be October um, 3rd, 2017. And a Bing image was used for pre event, and that was from October and December 2013. And you can see these the two uh, pre and post event images used uh, right up here. Uh, so since the product was created as soon as possible after the event, it is a preliminary analysis and not validate, not fully validated with field data. So all of these uh, products that are generated by the disaster, the International Charter, are freely available. You can download them directly without even having an, uh, to establish an account. So other surface deformation related applications, and one of them is um, volcanoes. So volcanic hazard is any volcanic process that threatens life or destroys land or infrastructure. And when you think of a volcanic eruption, you think of this red hot lava rushing down a slope of a volcano. And while this is perhaps the most remarkable feature of a volcano, Lava is not the only hazardous material to fall from a volcano. So a lot of times volcanic activity can be predicted because of the ground movement surrounding the volcano. And volcanic activity can trigger earthquakes and landslides. So a landslide is a mass movement of rock fragments, soil and debris um, going uh, on the downslope. And landslides can happen um, at any mountain where the slope of the mountain has become less stable. Um, and landslides are associated with volcanic activity because the volcanic mountain is weakened by magma and pressure brewing inside. And this can weaken the slopes of the volcano, leading to landslides. So ARIA has, um, has an example of a, a volcanic eruption, so an, interfer an interferogram that was generated um, due to a volcanic eruption. And Dr. Fielding will discuss interpretation of this product. And these type of products can be useful to determine areas that might be a risk uh, for landslides before an eruption, um, given the instability of the mountain. So uh, we also use interferograms to study volcanoes. Uh, volcanoes, uh, the magma motion underground, and uh, can also deform the Earth's surface, and we can measure that with the satellites. In this slide, we're showing data from uh, the JAXA ALOS-2 satellites, called ALOS-2, uh, which has a, a different radar wavelength, uh, which is 24 centimeters. And because this is a, a 24 centimeter radar wavelength, also called L-band, uh, the contour lines are 12 centimeters each. That means that uh, here in the middle of this uh, image on the left, we can see that there is a, a large number of fringes uh, in three different places. Uh, uh, on the left edge of the image, there is the fringes, the contours that are surrounding the uh, Kilauea caldera. That's showing the area where the uh, caldera is collapsing due to the withdrawal of magma uh, from that area. And then over at the eastern edge uh, the, to the right, there is an area where there's a, a, number, a large number of fringes uh, partially uh, blocked out uh, due to the very large deformation. Uh, and lava flows. 
uh, where that's the area where the, the magma moved into and then came out of the ground. So by looking at these maps, we can see which parts of the volcano are moving up and which parts are moving down uh, and how much they're moving. So on the left, the, the image is uh, showing the large deformation that happened between December of 2017 and uh, the, the early part of the eruption in June of, of 2018. The, the, the big eruption started in May. So this includes a, a large, the very large deformation that happened in, in the first month of the uh, eruption. And on the right here, we show it's a, an interferogram over a much shorter time interval. This is only 14 days during, during May. And during this time interval, uh, we can see that there's a, there's a more separated uh, pattern with a, a, a bullseye around uh, the Kilauea caldera where the magma was being uh, taken out at, at, and the ground surface moving down. And over on the right is the area, the lower east rift zone uh, around uh, Leilani Estates, where the magma has moved into the area and is forcing the ground up and apart uh, and causing uh, lava flows at the surface. So by studying these uh, uh, interferograms, we're able to see which parts of the volcano are are losing magma and which parts are uh, the magma is moving into it being in, in, injected and possibly uh, know how much uh, more we're, uh, lava is going to come to the surface. Uh, so these two uh, images are taken from a different, uh, the satellite takes images both when it's moving north uh, uh, the one on the left is when the, the satellite was taken, when the, the satellite was moving to the north. And the one on the left takes it as the, when the satellite is moving south on the other side of the Earth. As the Earth rotates around, and you get both sides. Uh, so we get uh, uh, two different looks of, uh, at, at any given place, depending on when the satellite comes over. and there's a uh, component of um, horizontal and vertical motion in these interferograms, uh, which is a little bit more complicated than we have time to discuss today. But um, the important thing is to note that these interferograms are showing uh, 12 centimeter con color contours, whereas the Sentinel-1 uh, interferograms are showing three centimeter contours. For example, the uh, on this uh, right image, if we start at the outside uh, and move inward, we can count the number of fringes. There's one, two, three, four uh, fringes there. Each one of those is 12 centimeters. That means that the ground moved down by four times 12 is 48 centimeters uh, during this uh, 12, uh, 14 day period. Uh, there may be some uh, additional motion inside of that inner uh, inner contour that uh, is is too large to be measured by this interferogram, because uh, that's uh, the part where the caldera itself is uh, was collapsing. Uh, and then over here on the right side, where the uh, in the area of Leilani Estates where the lava flows came to the surface, we can also count the interferogram uh, fringes, one, two, three, four, five. There's five fringes there, so each one of those is 12 centimeters. That's 60 centimeters of motion uh, in the radar uh, look direction uh, uh, in, the, in that area, and that motion is in the up direction, up and, and to the west. So. By combining uh, observations from different satellites and different uh, uh, radar look directions, we were able to get a, a, a full picture of how the, the ground moved uh, over time. For 
some volcanoes uh, around the world that have uh, steeper slopes. The Hawaii, Hawaiian volcanoes generally have very mild slopes because it's a, what we call a shield volcano uh, with a very uh, moderate slope. Other uh, volcanoes that have very steep slopes, um, such as uh, Mount Pinatubo or uh, many, many volcanoes in Indonesia and Central America, uh, have very steep slopes. And they also uh, emit a lot of ash in, in, as part of the eruption. Uh, so a lot of times after the eruption, there's even further danger uh, of a, a special type of landslide on volcanoes that involves uh, water and uh, the volcanic ash that we call a lahar. It's a, it's a very uh, uh, devastating uh, type of uh, uh, landslide or, or mud flow debris flow that uh, includes volcanic ash. Uh, and that uh, can be one of the biggest uh, risks for volcanoes around the world. So I'll now discuss products related to identifying areas at risk for landslides and landslide damage. So landslides uh, can be triggered by a number of reasons, including uh, rainfall, earthquake, mining, volcanoes, as discussed, freezing and thawing of the land surface, including snowmelt. However, most landslides are triggered because of excess rainfall. Landslides are very sudden and can be very tragic events. And worldwide, they've killed over 26,000 people since 2007. So that's an average of 3,700 per year. And the figure on the right shows global landslide fatalities from 1998 through 2017, with larger circles representing a greater number of deaths. Some of the most recent major landslides have occurred in the Asian continent. So for example, in 2013, over 5,000 5, people perished in the state of Uttarakhand in India due to landslides triggered by heavy precipitation. So the US, the UK, Australia, and New Zealand contain a large number of reported landslides, but few fatalities. And these four countries account for 27.5 percent of landslide reports, but only 0.7 percent of fatalities. And in these areas, smaller landslides are better ID due to accessibility. So just some interesting statistics. There is an R set training that might be of interest, which covers landslides, their formation, different types of landslides and their triggers. And this is part of the disaster management webinar series training, which took place in June of 2016. And session four is the one that discusses landslides. The recording can be accessed freely through the link provided here. In the next couple of slides, I'll discuss products that provide information on areas at risk for landslides. So NASA has a global landslide hazard assessment for situational awareness, LASA, model to provide situational awareness of landslide hazards. Uh, a LASA landslide nowcast is created by comparing GPM precipitation data from the last seven days to the long-term precipitation record provided by TRIM, which started in uh, 2001, and the iMERGE um, starting from 2014. So the record covers the period of 2001 through present. And the past seven days of rainfall are considered. Each day is weighted according to their date before present. So the last 24 hours have the most impact. In places where precipitation is unusually high, the susceptibility of the terrain is evaluated and it includes quantitative information on whether roads have been built, trees have been cut down or burned, uh, whether there's a major tectonic fault nearby, if the local bedrock is weak, and if the hillsides are steep. The figure on the right shows a close-up of the potential landslide activity during July in Southeast Asia, 
as evaluated by NASA's landslide hazard assessment model, LASA. Overlaid on top are reported landslide fatalities dating back to 2007. So the larger that circle, that pink circle, uh, the larger the number of fatalities. And the actual colors on the map indicate the probability of a landslide. Um, so uh, red indicates that there's a higher probability. So there are two portals where you can access information about um, landslides. And one is the disasters portal, and the other one is the precipitation measurement mission website. So let's visit uh, both of those portals. And, and they have pros and cons. The disasters website, uh, it includes um, landslide, uh, now cast, and precipitation. And it's a bit easier to manipulate. But let's, um, let, let's visit both of those and, and show you the capabilities. So let's start with the um, precipitation, the PPM, PMM uh, website. And this is the main page, the global landslide model. And following the link that's in the slide. And so if you click here, you can um, then access this tool on the global landslide nowcast. So if you go, you have different options here on the data set that you want to use. But if you want to do a global landslide nowcast, or let's see, this, this one here, and we want to make it global, and you load the data. you'll have an indication of the areas where there's moderate risk or high risk of landslides. So moderate risk are areas that are where the points are in yellow, and high risk are areas where the points are in orange or red. And, and so again, these are all um, risks based on precipitation only. Okay, and it's based on precipitation anomalies and based on the terrain. So the other option is to go to the NASA disasters portal. And you have a number of different uh, tools here. One is, um, is a map of the disasters, the different tier disasters that the portal has generated products for. Um, so that includes landslides. And so here's a map. You click on the map, and whatever has a orange, uh, sorry, a, a pink or a dark purple um, circle indicates that it has been a, a landslide. And these are all the tier zero landslides. So that one was in Uganda. But um, you can scroll down and look at the different tier responses related to landslides. So uh, tier two is uh, dark blue. Uh, tier one is a diamond that's uh, purple. And then tier zero is a circle. So that's just to see the events that have occurred. You can also go to the landslides icon further down on the main page. And that will take you to another page that has a list of different landslide-related events. So you can click on any of these for more information on that specific event. And you can also uh, access the map viewer, the NASA map viewer, which allows you to view different landslide-related events. So you go to map viewer, 
and so let's so we have what we have here is a global landslide susceptibility map right where the red areas are areas that are more susceptible um, the blue areas are less susceptible so blue areas tend to be um, flat and they tend to account for all of the different um, terrain conditions that I discussed earlier. So we can add other products. And in order to do that, you add search for layers. And let's take a look at products related to landslides. So let's take a look at time enabled global landslide now cast. And this is a description of that product, and we add it to the map. So here we have two products loaded. We have the global landslide susceptibility map, and we'll turn that off. And then we have the time-enabled global land, light, landslide nowcast. And it goes from March 5th, 2019 through April. Right. So the areas that are red are areas where there's high risk, and the areas that are yellow are areas where there's a lower risk. So this is a, a great way to uh, load different and view different landslide-related products. And if you want to add other landslide-related products for visualization, um, you can just, just do a search for landslides and you'll have a list of different products. So here we have an example of a 2017 mudslide that occurred in Colombia. And this is a, a product uh, from the ARIA uh, portal. And during this event, there was extreme precipitation which caused flash floods and mudslides that killed over 250 people in the town of Mocoa in Colombia. And the image on the left shows rainfall from iMERGE from the period of March 26th through April 2nd, 2017. iMERGE indicates that areas that the uh, area rainfall totals uh, during the week were frequently greater than 80 millimeters. So that's around 3.1 inches. And this analysis also shows the locations of heavy rainfall that extended from east of Makoa into the high mountains that surround the city. And note that there were areas where there was up to 200 millimeters of rainfall during this period. So these, these are dark red um, and, and these areas here had a, just an enormous amount of rainfall throughout this week. The image on the right shows the global landslide susceptibility map for the affected region, overlaid with the estimated total fatalities due to landslides from 2007 through 2016. This data was generated as, um, as part of NASA's global landslide catalog project. So the colors, the, uh, the red colors indicate that the susceptibility of that area was high, susceptibility for a landslide. Uh, while the green indicates that it's low. So the International Disasters Charter page also contains information on landslides. And in order to find this particular event, this is a landslide, the one that occurred in, in Colombia in 2017. You go to the, uh, to the activations link on the disasters charter uh, website and you scroll down to September uh, to April of 2017 and you select floods in Colombia so even though this is listed as floods in Colombia it also has products related to the mudslides okay so if you scroll down here you'll see a number of different products that were derived um, related to this event so for example, here's an, here's an animation of the event that's before and after. So you've got the main river channel, you've got the cities, and then the orange areas are areas where 
there was um, flood, uh, a mud deposited right around the river channel. Okay, so you've got um, debris flow. Uh, you've got areas potentially affected by the mud flow. Uh, this is a map that shows that the orange areas were the areas that were potentially affected by the, this uh, massive uh, mud flow. So let's uh, zoom in here. Right, so you've got the city delineated and then specific areas further that might have been affected by the mud flow, or at least areas where mud is detected in the satellite images. Okay, and then there's another product here related to damage assessment. Um, so the red areas are areas uh, where there's likely, the, the, the areas that were most likely damaged, right? And the blue areas are areas with the lowest potential for damage. So the last thing I want to show you is a tool, and it's the Global Landslide Catalog, which feeds into the LASA model. And it has a catalog of global landslides since 2007. It identifies rainfall-triggered landslide events. And the GLC um, considers all types of uh, mass movements triggered by rainfall, which have been reported either in the media, in disaster databases, scientific reports, or other sources. So in order to, I'll show you that web page, go to this link here. And here you have that slide catalog. And you can zoom in and out. And if you place your cursor on any given uh, event, you'll have um, a window that pops up that will provide specific information about that event. Okay. Another web page that I wanted to show you is the NASA Landslide Viewer. And this is, again, it, uh, a great way to visualize landslides that have occurred. And so there's a, an option up on the top left that allows you to visualize different data products. Right? So you can uh, visualize uh, landslides, so all the landslide points, the same ones that you saw previously, um, you can visualize uh, just different data sets. Some are very specific. For example, this Oregon historic landslides, Washington scarps and flanks beginning in 2017, uh, Washington scale landslides from geological mapping, Kentucky. Um, there's also the landslide susceptibility image layer that you can upload. Uh, that tells you all of the areas around the world that are susceptible to landslides based on terrain conditions. Uh, you can look at rainfall. And if you want more information about each of these, you click on these um, three points at the end and click on show item details. And a new window will open with a description of that particular layer. Okay. And you can also open these in Map Viewer, what I showed you earlier. So this is an overview of the different products that you can access to address earthquakes and landslides, uh, risk or um, uh, damage assessments or impacts. And uh, even though some of these or a lot of these are not operational per se, uh, they will be in the future, and they're also examples of the type of products that you can derive with existing data sets. So all of these are intended to be informative and to help guide in any, any decision-making activity. And there is no perfect product, again, as mentioned um, in other webinars. It depends on, on the event, on where your location and, and the time and what sort of resources are available to image that specific event. So with this, I am, am ending this, this complete webinar series on disaster scenarios and 
Uh, just to remind you that there is a homework associated with this uh, last uh, webinar, uh, and it is do due two weeks from now. And now I'll open this um, webinar for your uh, questions, and, and I'll uh, try to answer them as best as possible. Thank you very much. Great. So uh, let's start here with uh, uh, your questions. What we'll do is you type in the questions in the chat box, and uh, we will be responding to your questions. So Dr. Mehta is online, and she will uh, be helping to answer some of the questions that will come up. And we'll be typing the answers here on the Google Doc that you see on your screen. OK, so let's start with question number one. Is it possible that we can access the data before any earthquake happens in Afghanistan? Not, not for an earthquake. Earthquake, there are events that happen, happen very quickly, and they are very unpredictable. And so you won't be able to have any data before the earthquake. There might be imagery, though, um, before an event, if that's what you're asking about. So kind of a, to set the, the baseline on how conditions were before an event. But that, um, that would be something that you would have to specifically search for. So if you're assessing earthquake damage, for example, you always need a before image and an after image to determine uh, the extent of the formation in the surface. Question number two, how does one model landslides from differential interferometric SAR and rainfall data? So what you're looking for with um, interferometric SAR are small movements in the hillside. And you want to identify areas that are susceptible to landslides. So when you identify these areas at risk and you couple that with large precipitation events, then you have a, or you can allocate a larger risk to that specific area, um, a larger list risk for a landslide to that specific area. Only with interferometry can we monitor dimensions of damage caused by an earthquake. That is correct. So if you're using radar, uh, the only way to assess the formation of the surface is through interferometry. How do you choose the temporal interval between imagery to derive interferograms? So what you want to do is you want to select the before and after, but uh, it, it doesn't have to be that far apart, the images. In fact, um, sometimes if the images are too far apart in time, uh, they tend to uh, decorrelate depending on the land cover. So it, it'll depend on the imagery that's available ultimately. Radar sensors are side looking. How do you translate the number of fringes to centimeters? So that has to do with the wavelength that's used by the radar sensor. And I suggest you visit the SAR webinar trainings that we've done. So we've done two, an introduction to SAR and an advanced SAR training. And both of these webinar series have had a component on interferometric SAR, specifically looking at earthquakes. And we'll have another SAR training, advanced SAR training, uh, later this year, sometime in the middle of this year. Uh, and we'll probably be focusing on interferometric SAR again for a specific application. Most probably will be landslides, but we'll be announcing that within the next uh, month, month and a half. In the volcano events, can surface temperature or surface temperature differences be correlated with deformations? If so, how, uh, 
how close to real time can these data be collected and accessed? Uh, so I, I'm not sure about that. I'm not a volcano expert. However, you cannot measure temperature differences with radar. Um, it, you, you might need to be to use something else. How can we use SAR images for gully erosion since the depth of them are very high, like 15 meters? How can we use SAR images for... Uh, again, this would be the same technique if I understand this application correctly. So if you want to look at erosion, then uh, through time, with interferometric SAR, you can detect uh, changes in the land surface on the order of centimeters. Is there a routinely updated INSAR product available for most of the Earth's surface? Unfortunately, there isn't. However, uh, the ARIA platform is looking at producing INSAR products for certain disaster related events. And the NISAR mission, which is a satellite mission, a joint satellite mission between NASA and the Indian Space Agency, uh, which will be launched in 2021, 2022 timeframe. Um, this will be producing uh, routine INSAR products. Can you point to the NASA products on deriving the earthquake induced landslide? I'm not sure about that specifically, earthquake induced landslide. So maybe Dr. Mehta, who's online, she might know. Otherwise, we'll update this uh, answer uh, later on and post it. So I'm also not 100% sure, but the NASA disaster portal, when it, it reports a landslide, it also attributes a cause for that if it is known. So if it's a landslide that is induced by an earthquake, then it will be it will be there on, on the disaster portal that uh, Dr. Podes just showed. Okay, so thank you for that. The next one, question 10, is there any remote sensing product that routinely measures the distance between fixed triangulation points on the Earth's surface so, so as to highlight strain vectors? Not that I'm aware of, not something that is being routinely done. Question 11, the product related to damages after earthquakes provided by UNITAR, is it vector or raster format? What is the unit of measure? So we're verifying this. So if you go on the landslide, uh, rainfall induced landslide in, um, in PMM, uh, I'm looking for it, I think, uh, that rain, rain fall induced landslide, it takes care of terrain, so a hilly side landslide because of rain, they are included in, in that model. And I'm looking for that. So you may want to see this site on precipitation measurement mission website. Um, there is a reference uh, which talks about a global landslide uh, model and a rainfall triggered landslide. And that I believe has um, terrain component, also soil moisture component. So these references are given on this site also. Okay, question number 13. What is the accuracy of differential interferometry over a pair of Sentinel-1 SAR images? Or what is the minimum deformation detectable with a pair of Sentinel-1 SAR images? I'm, I'm not sure I quite understand this. So these are two different um, methods. One is interferometric uh, synthetic aperture radar, INSAR, and that allows you to 
detect deformation on the surface on the order of centimeters. And that would be related to the length of the wavelength, right? So the frequency that the radar sensor uses. And in order to do differential interferometry, you use the phase of the signal. Uh, then there are these SAR images, which are the actual images that, that you see and, and you interpret, these images that have a range of, um, of uh, black to white, right? So those are based on the amplitude of the signal. And you cannot do measurements of the surface on the order of centimeters with the images, with the amplitude-based images. So you cannot do a deformation measurements with the amplitude-based images. Is there any model which describes the relation between rainfall and landslide in intensity in any hill land area? Uh, yes. Uh, if you visit that uh, PMM site, so it's the same site that was posted earlier, has a reference to a landslide model, which takes care of it. it's landslide because of heavy rain, but it is in in hilly area as well as it, it takes into account how moist the surface is, the soil moisture also. Great. So the next question, what is the vertical accuracy of differential interferometry over a pair of sentinel SAR images? What is the minimum vertical deformation detectable with a pair of sentinel SAR images. So with a pair of sentinel SAR images that are amplitude based, you, you cannot measure deformation, surface deformation. You need the phase to measure surface deformation. Right, so if you have something like an L-band sensor like Pulsar, you can measure surface deformation on the order of centimeters, on the order of, uh, let's see, six, uh, with, with Sentinel-1, it's on the order of six centimeters. What is the upper interval for the global landslide susceptibility map? So the model that uses GPM iMERGE, it would be daily. So data are available at sub-daily scale, but uh, if so, it, it, the model is run, I think, at every few hours or every hour. And I, uh, again, if you go to the website that was given previously has the reference, and I'm, I'm going to type the reference here also. So it uses seven-day accumulated precipitation every day and then runs the model. So if you see the website, there's a flow chart given how, uh, so at least once a day, the model is run, it looks like. But it uses past seven day of accumulated rainfall. Okay, so the next question. IRNSS, -R is an Indian regional GPS system which is working on L-band in the microwave spectrum. Is it possible to use the system for interferometric studies? I'm not really familiar with this system. Um, it, I, I'll have to look into it, whether they're collecting phase and if they are, um, and there are a lot of other variables that need to be accounted for. And I'm not sure if they're accounting for these things. So I can look into it and update the answer to this question. What is the best model for landslide modeling? So I think if landslide, if it's occurring because of rainfall, then we talked about the model earlier, but it is occurring because of earthquake or because of volcano, I'm not sure which model to use. Okay, and I'm seeing on the chat box, 
Another question, someone says, I'm looking for a high res DEM to accurately model the terrain which can be used as a proxy for soil shear wave velocity as well as slope factor for estimating landslide susceptibility. Yes, yeah, of course. So a, a DM, a high-res DM, is very important. And in terms of a global DM, there's SRTM. Well, it's almost global, uh, up to 60 degrees north and south. And then there's Aster. Uh, and there are some regional DMs that are of higher resolution than SRTM or ASTER, which are about 30 meters, one arc second. So this is always uh, an issue, is always uh, trying to have a, a better, higher resolution DM. Okay. So that that's it in terms of the questions. Um, I so I'd like to remind you that the this question and answer session, this document that you see uh, is going to be posted so you can always go back and, and refer to what was discussed in this session. The recordings are going to be posted and the material is going to be posted too. And this concludes this disaster scenarios webinar series. And uh, it, so we've covered uh, tropical storms, we've covered floods, and today we covered landslides and earthquakes. So remember that there is a homework associated with each of these webinars. And in order for you to receive your certificate of completion, you must hand in this homework. So they're due two weeks from um, each webinar. Uh, so finally, I'd like to thank you for uh, your interest, for joining this webinar series, and I'd also like to thank uh, everyone that was involved in putting this together, uh, uh, Brock Blevins, Elizabeth Hook, Sean McCartney, Selwyn Hudson, and Dr. Amita Mehta, and Dr. Eric Fielding. Uh, wishing everyone a great day and hope to see you in the next webinar series. Bye-bye.